effect. Oh, there, there is in yes. fact right the now a podcast uh, on internet you can find where he talks that after that book it has become an obsession for him. Yes. Uh, every morning he in fact uh, has a ritual of translating this poem again. <laughs> oh, you're kidding. Yeah, well, he taught himself yeah. Russian more or less. I don't know if they say that he really knows it, but to, to do push they, in. They interviewed him on Radio Lab, yeah, the radio show Radio Lab. Lab. Oh, right. yeah. And he's a portion of a larger show, but it, he talks about that project. That's the other thing is that there's so much online now. Yes. People translate it, translators writing and speaking. Right. And yeah. so there's so many. And our students can find more than we can, than I can, at mm. least, you know, of resources. Talk about. So, so theory is a part of it, and I've already done an introductory course to these people, so we've done some basic theor theoretical background, but the main idea is probably thematic, to going through some of the, you know, different challenges that you come up with. And then after that, they, we do, we do exercises at home and bring them to class and, and work through those, and then from there each student has a project going into their native language, something untranslated if at all possible. The other thing we, we did is do um, audiovisual translation, which is a complete learning experience for me. And I had a student who'd done, who actually was working on video game translation, so he kind of took over and helped, helped me do that section because I don't know what I was doing. But that's really, it's fun too because it's so creative and it really is very, there's a lot of the similar, the same strictures that you have to face. So it's just, it's it's very fun class to do. I, I would love to be able to do it in a more multilingual, Format like some of you have done, I'd be curious how you've done that because I think that's what we're all, what our university is going to try to move towards is, is more teaching a workshop like they do at Kent or something where they do it in, uh, in English and then break off. And I, I'm not sure how, I would like to be able to, I'm not sure how to do that. So I'm, that's my question. I want to start with that question. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, in a multi-language multi -language environment, they're breaking yeah. up. I mean, I think, I think so you it's really started with a literal yeah. translation, and that and that they work in different languages. Yes, okay. and then it also allows them if they do if they they can translate it to another language, but if they don't have another language, they can simply translate it translate it into English. Mm -hmm. I uh, think but stick to a specific language. Mm -hmm. So how did the discussion go? Well, I mean, it it took us inevitably into into directions. Allowed the students to focus on the notion of literality and how that in itself can be problematic. I had to read a couple of yeah. Uh, yeah. articles about that, and of course, the big exchange between that book of Ed Edmund Wilson around the time he was publishing his translation of the thing that gave, but also the possibility, the possibility of translating poetry. Uh, I thought it was a very productive, or that was part of the discussion about whether you can translate poetry. Structure. 
you repeat the name of the work or the person at the book? It's uh, Eugenio Nevin by the translation by I was going to add that with um, a multilingual group. I don't teach at the university. I teach community at the Bethesda Writers Center. I'm Nancy Mia mm -hmm. Carlson. And when we have a group of everybody speaking different languages, one technique that I like is taking a Shakespearean sonnet and then having everyone translate into English. And that way you get into the whole concept. These are for beginners. How to look at translation, how it really stresses that um, it brings out the point that it has to read like a contemporary, contemporarily written piece, and that gets them talking, even though they come from different languages. I should mention while I go when you ask my target audience that these are our undergraduates and they're liberal arts students, select liberal arts. Um, but I, I, I probably should have concluded with what's the value of it. You know, I don't have to tell us where the congregation. But I thought it was very interesting today in the keynote when uh, you know, I hear somebody from Middlebury saying, oh, by the way, translation. Yeah. And, and we have that same polemic in, in our department where uh, when you ask, was this done in English or in Spanish, this is done in English. And I felt maybe my colleagues weren't looking down, but I felt like I had to defend it a little bit. Sure. And one of the things that um, I started using these as cliches, and after a while I sort of convinced myself it's true. What, the course evaluations have said that they've gotten out of the thing is not only a better understanding of, of, of language, but critical thinking. You know, you can't translate and, and not work with critical thinking skills. I think this was at first bogus, but now I understand what they're saying. And it was the ability to really have a collaborative project. You know, when you're dealing with two and then four and then eight and sixteen, this generation has to learn how to collaborate. And so they, they uh, and then the final thing was this. I hate this cliche, but it's a, this tolerance of ambiguity, yeah. and you know this notion of even though it's the humanities, they still are told all the time what's right, wrong, and binary type way, and they really it's a liberating thing to find out that your translation and mine are both okay, but now how are we going to defend it? And um, the final coup on that at the end, this is something we should probably all be doing with all our students, is when I do criticize them, they get upset, and at the end of the semester. I show them my own comments that I've gotten from editors, and they think, wow, they really, you know, they, I can't believe an editor told you this. It's like, yeah, this is what happens in translation. So these are the values that go beyond just the product that I think we can tell our own. We, do, we can do a better job telling our own colleagues who are not in translation what the value our students receive in these translation workshops. I want to say something here, uh, because last year, uh, I'm at the University of Iowa, I direct the MFA in Literary Translation, which is a multilingual graduate level program where any given year we may have anywhere from six to, in fact, last spring we had 13 different languages in the class. Um, a couple of people were translating from more than one language. It's, it's really an amazingly gifted group and everything. Uh, the other interesting thing that happened at Iowa is that the program moved into the division of world languages, literatures, and cultures, it's a little bit like putting the lamb inside the lion's den, right? Yeah. And there was uh, quite a bit of resistance because of the paradigm, right? I mean, uh, Russell has written very beautifully about this. I mean, you know, in language instruction, translation is a pedagogy to learn uh, language. And so it's we began- It's an outmoded pedagogy. Well, it is an outmoded <laughs> pedagogy, but we, so we, we began um, my arrival there with um, conversations like saying, of course, we translate to the originals and we learn. Of course, they don't have enough language skills to really do a translation, to do justice and all that. So one thing that um, occurred to me, and I th am surprisingly uh, managed to success, uh, convince everyone, is we created an undergraduate minor in translation for global literacy. Cool. Now, so that students can actually take courses bi-directional. The courses they take in Spanish and French and German that where they translate into the foreign language 
also count toward this minor because the goal of the minor is to uh, encourage an exploration of translation as both a mode of inquiry and a mode of exchange, right? I mean, value exchange. So we created a course called Translation and the Global Society. That's the gateway course. And here, students will be sort of uh, exploring translation in all sorts of contexts. Human rights, health, you know, public health, literature, arts, and everything. And then students have to take two just outright translation workshops. These are going to be geared more toward the textual literary translation. But then students can take two additional courses in their language programs. Because again, what we did is we sort of broadened the frame. And we said, OK, what we're doing here is understanding the functions of translation in the global era. And you know, there's a huge amount of literature uh, right now about global literacy as a liberal arts objective. And it has learning outcomes. I mean, the, you know, if you go to um, the Association of American Universities and Colleges, AUC um, uh, website, there, you can download all their learning outcomes and you know, rubrics up to your nose if you want. But the interesting thing here is you, they give, those documents give you a calm, safe, neutral, common space to not even engage that age-old friction between literary translation and language uh, inquisi uh, inquisition. <laughs> 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 yes, yes, they do. <laughs> language pedagogy. Also but, <laughs> but it's in fact, <laughs> this was a good one. Uh, but, but, I mean, people, uh, one example is uh, one of our very brilliant and seasoned, like 2025, Michel Aron, 20 some years he has been teaching a stylistics course. French. French, 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 French studies. studies, and he always underscores French, French, French. After this uh, dialogue, he came and said, you know what, maybe I can do this multilingually. So there is an interesting thawing that happens when people engage the questions somewhere outside their territories. If you're interested in all this, it's all on the website. You know, just go on the MFA in Literary Translation at the University of Iowa, and there is a link there, Translation for Global Literacy. And the whole program is outlined, goals and all of that. And the surprise is this. I don't know where you are, but public research ones are suffering tremendously uh, in, you know, from budget cuts and all of that. And um, lo and behold, the college fast-tracked this minor. So much so that the minor got approved before we could finish putting together the syllabi and stuff. They got so excited. So I mean, there is an interesting um, new space you can carve for yourself. I'm laughing because I used to be at that institution. <laughs> so, and, and yeah. So um, yeah. so so I know the, the multilingual environment, the multilingual workshop, uh, pretty well uh, from having taught in it, and it's it's very dynamic. It's also a little slightly. I mean, I. I, I commiserate with Aaron all the time because he's now in it and I'm not. And uh, I recognize the slightly privileged environment and it probably looks slightly privileged from your standpoint too because it's a highly writer-centric environment. There are lots of writing programs. There are five different MFAs in creative writing. There's creative writing for nonfiction, fiction, poetry, playwriting, and then the translation workshop. And there are all these writers all around. And so you, all you gotta do is add a little bit of language expertise get great translations. You get fantastic translations. And so it's a, in a way it teaches them, teaches itself. When the director of the program retired, there were a couple of years, Danny Weisport, when he retired, there were a couple of years when there was nobody to teach in it. And the students were so good, they just did it themselves. <laughs> These are grad students that they just taught themselves. Yeah, last night they had the session. I mean, this includes Jennifer Croft. She was a graduate of yeah. those years. She has 
published like three or four published translations already, Becca McKay and Jamie Richards. They were all graduates of that year. Becca, uh, sorry, Jamie is a finalist in the NTA for this year. So they, they all pretty much did it themselves. It was just amazing, very high quality students. Um, so I, I sort of think, if I look at it now from outside and think, wow, that was, that was great <laughs> that I could teach in a, in a program like that. Um, and, but we don't all have that you know, kind of luxury. But undergraduate translation workshops, we be, I mean, we begin as if this is a creative writing workshop because they have to first figure out how to read, and then how a, how to read a work to understand how it is constructed. I mean, that's really what we do as translators, right? That's where it begins. So it, it's perfectly fine to spend the first month feeling like. Am I teaching translation here, or is this really a literary analysis course? Well, you're doing literary analysis, but you're also constantly infusing that conversation with translation techniques, with terminology. You know. That's where I was going. So if I, yeah. I'll go to the, the next step is so not being in that environment. I took things from it that I think are highly portable. You can take them to a lot of different places. So one is in an environment where you're just teaching an undergrad lit class just undergrad lit, any kind of literature. And one of the exercises you can have students do is you take, it has to be a work that has some canonical status because you need multiple translations. So you get five translations of the same passage from this work and you give it to students and you say, well, let's look at, first you do a little analysis, you look to see what the stylistic differences are and you talk about choices. Well, why is this line different from that line? Not better, just different. You're not looking at the source text. They, they don't even have access to the source text. I don't even show them the source text. You talk about the stylistic differences and then you say, okay, well, let's, this is a, this is a page taken out of the writers in the schools program in the Center for the Center for Theory, Art, and Translation. Do this with third graders. You say, well, let's make our own. Let's make our own versions. You pick the version, the, the, the lexical pieces that you think are better, or the lines that you think are better, and make your own version of whatever this is. And I've done it with five trip, five um, tercets from the Inferno. It's five different versions of of three tercets, let's say, three, nine lines from the Inferno. I've done it with the first paragraph of Notes from Dostoevsky, Notes from Underground which is really, really good, because the, the differences in lexical choices are really amazing. Is he wicked? Is he evil? Spiteful. Is he spiteful? I mean, these right. really change the psychology versus the morality of the character. And you talk about those things, and then when they create their, their own version, you don't just stop with that. You say, now you write me 500 words about your version. In other words, tell me why you made the choices that you made and what it is you're trying to do, because that's the only way I can judge it. Right? It's a rhetorical document. You're trying to convince somebody, you're trying to move somebody somehow. So you have an audience in mind. Is it high school students? Is it uh, college students? Are you gonna create a scholarly apparatus? Is it people who read Twitter feeds? I've had students do their version as a, a series of Twitter feeds, just, just tweets. I've had students do uh, LOL cat speak. You know LOL cat speak? Cats that talk on the internet. Anyway, and then but some but the five but the five hundred word description is the is the real thing because then they have to describe what it is that they just did and then you can judge by comparing what they say that they think they did with with what they did and then you can say well you know a third grader is not likely to know these words so you should think about your audience a little bit more it's it's too sophisticated for an audience or your your apparatus is all wrong for the audience that you're thinking. That's, so that's a, it's, a, it's a very easy thing you can throw into any course as long as you have multiple translations of the same, same uh, work. Are there, are there other multiple translations that people use that they recommend? Let me, let me say to you that Russell and I, because we've talked about this before, so this year I went and, and put together a course called Retranslation. And the whole course is on retranslation. And in fact, it so happens that the translation studies people having nothing else to do now are very heavily into theorizing about retranslation, which in the end you realize you really can't. Maybe you can be theoretical about it, but I don't know that you can have a theory. Um, but we did some theory things, and then I asked each person to choose 
a landmark text in the language culture they know and present sort of an analysis of retranslations. And it's just going wonderfully. They can do this work now. There is a beautiful um, handbook, Princeton, uh, no, is it Princeton or Oxford? Um, Guide to Translation in English. It's a, it's a handbook that lists oh, yeah. all the translations done into English of all major works. I mean, there is a section on German. You have all the Rilke translations, all the Goethe translations. So you can also populate the course if you want with them yourself. But the students themselves know also where to find them. And then the third piece of the course will be when they will retranslate a passage from those texts. So they will have also experience with it. But it's, it's a great pedagogy. The other thing is, you know, we, we talk about the 3%. Just think about it. So, so there are about five, 500 titles that get translated into English. Most of these books sell about from 200 to 500 copies. So we really need also to emphasize a cultivation of a learned audience for translation. The performing arts colleagues are ahead of us, right? They had these courses on music appreciation, I mean, really badly, unfortunately titled. But they know that they have to create patrons of their art. So in a way, teaching students translation in the undergraduate level is all about teaching them to become learned appreciators of translated text. Because if we don't increase the readers, number of readers, it would be really lethal to increase the number of translations out there. I was going to add to one of the things I do that I, I, I didn't know whether to have them write the, you said the 500 word essay, um, sure. you know, how um, make your choice. And then I, I found at times they would vary from, they would want to spend four paragraphs on sort of showing off why they chose that word, and other times they want to go quick. So what we ultimately decided on, and I thought it would be terrible, but I think this generation doesn't mind at all. They just use, uh, we, we do everything on Word and sh share, and they just use the comments and the margins. Excellent. That also, you know, it That's helped great. them with their partner then go through and either accept it or decline it. They got them in that editorial mode. And so I found that that was a very quick way for me to go through and let them take my eyes to where they wanted to, to see them. And that was a very easy way to grade things, too. There's also a book that I've used uh, that I think is pretty helpful. It's, a, it's called um, The Poem Itself. It's a Stanley Burnshaw. Uh, the reason I like it is that it, it, it's, uh, it's got everything you need on two pages. So it has, so let's say it has a poem by Baudelaire in the original, and then it has a linear, an in, a linear translation, so a literal, pretty, pretty rough translation. Then some discussion of the commentary, uh, sorry, the context, a little historical, clear historical information, and uh, some interpret, like an in analysis. But it's all in two pages, and so you can give that to the student. There's no, there's no polished translation there. That's that's what's not miss, what that's what's missing. So you can give them those two pages and say let. Make a polished translation on the basis of this, and it's called the poem itself. The poem itself, and he's got I think he's got French, German, Spanish, Italian in that. Uh, there may be one or two Russian poems in there, but mostly it's French, German, Spanish, and Italian, and mostly canonical writers. Uh, and he has a second book I think it's called the Hebrew poem itself. So if you want to pick a language that nobody knows in your class, <laughs> you could try Hebrew, but you have to make sure nobody knows Hebrew. Whereas everybody else, that's going to be able to, usually Spanish or German, or so they're going to find something in that book that they know. Another so hand way yeah, in the go back. Ahead. Hey, yeah. um, just And Natasha just comes Elliot. in at 19 ways of looking at one way. Yeah, a, a major advocate for the book. Yes. <laughs> More books have been sold. I think it's uh, out of print. A very uh, popular 
uh, book it turned out for undergraduates uh, who took the translation workshop was in fact a beautiful collection of essays that Susan Bernowski and Esther Allen put together in translation. These are, these are also essays that are very accessible but also very uh, sort of hands-on, right? They really focus on the practice of translation. Students absolutely loved it. Can I say one more thing about, you asked about multilingual workshops, and I've seen a, a whole bunch of, of, a pretty wide variety of approaches. So some people don't use any modeling at all besides the student's own work. Uh, and some people like to use a lot of modeling. So they, they bring in samples and you do analyses, and then in between there's a variety. Some people use uh, trots very heavily. So they ask the students to create their own trots. The, Pony for the work, a very literal translation where they, uh, they, they show the original, at least in a Romanized form, I'm assuming it, they can, you can do that, uh, with Latin letters, and then pretty much show the words that correspond to those underneath, and then, then show even an intermediate translation in some cases. They show an intermediate, like a first try or a second draft, something like that, and then a polished version, and you go through all of that together. And I've seen all of those, and I think they all work pretty well. It really depends on your proclivities and your emphases in your, in your class. Um, yeah. Just a question about uh, how much creative writing should figure in a graduate literary translation program. Because for non native speakers, uh, let's say English is your foreign language or second language or yeah. third language. Uh, they can get all the grammar right. They can do all the yeah. grammar, you know, uh, analysis, whatever. Right. But if they cannot do great writing in English, right. when you get the, the translation, no. it, it, it reads so bad. And you it's know, just uh, grammatically correct, but it's not the word work. If you walk into the graduate workshop any given evening, you will wonder if this is a creative writing workshop or not. In part because, um, we, we focus quite extensively on the literary properties of a literary translation. So we have to actually ask the translator not to come clear about, come clean about the equivalency between words, but whether this piece of writing now works as a piece of literature in the receiving language. What are the analogs? What are the correspondences? What are the correlatives? I mean, and um, the other thing, again, you know, Russell mentioned this, it's a very, uh, it's a very exclusive place, Iowa, because the translation workshop will have the MFA in poetry people there and MFA in fiction people there, and they will, in fact, uh, insist on uh, keeping the literary um, discussion going, the literary and creative discussion going. Um, but how much do you, so the question though that I take from this is how much might you engage in editing or a discussion of editing at the stage where someone has brought work to the class who is non, a non-native speaker of English, let's say, and the articles might all be wrong and the tenses might all be wrong from the standpoint of the native speakers. They're looking at it and saying, well, I can't make heads or tails of this because I think this needs a the and that needs an uh, and this should be plural and that should be past tense and so on. How much of that discussion do you actually have in a class environment like that? I, I think it's a hard question. Well, uh, for example, uh, tomorrow there's going to be a session on punctuation, you know, uh, uh, not to anticipate, but these uh, sort of it's about how you approach these questions because, for example, when you have a sentence in a prose translation, you can ask this, you can say to the student, this is not reading well in English. And that's not necessarily a translation statement. But when you ask the student, why did you create this particular syntax? Why are the articles missing? And in fact, because sometimes they remove the articles because they are counting beats. They are trying to create a certain cadence. 
Now that becomes a translation discussion. You see what I mean? So it's, the onus is on the translator. And our job is to make them more and more conscious and deliberate about their translational choices. Well, I, I asked the question because the, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the translator, you have, I mean, that literature code, the appreciation of literature itself, the, the origin of the text, the country falls on the 19 ways of translating, one yeah. way that's uh, brought up. Uh, uh, if you ask me, I would say 17 or 18 of those translations miss the whole point. <laughs> it's because one way the poem is zen and the, the erasure, the uh, invisibility of the sub subjectivity of the poet, the I. And almost all the English translations so far from the I, I don't hear <laughs> is the subjectivity there. It doesn't matter how good. Yeah, yeah, the, the, we have a one way specialist in the back. No, no, no. Sorry. No, no. <laughs> no, that's just yeah. my. That, that's just my no, 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 no. You're up. Yeah. Yeah. So the literature, the sense of the literature of shaping the other, and, and also for me, the bias is the translator, especially when it comes to poetry, he or she better be a poet in that. Sort of too. That's a, I know it's a well, Natasha, you want to say something about Wang Wei? Well, I do because I want to say that in fact, the genius of Edward Wolfman is, is the critical combination of the translations into critical commentary, which is a kind of a compendium of strategies and methods, compounded further by the in inevitable uh, Wang Wangerian voice. And uh, so, which, which implies it further in the sense that it, it makes it clear that it's a person. So that it's one, and that you know that it could be three more. In fact, I have a personal little file folder in which I collect additional translations of the beer park as one of the my first lost habits. Um, because plurality is really what one is looking for, and in some ways that is also a way of solving the problem for not working with text for your novels and native speakers. That is, what you say, go ahead, produce two texts. Produce Gavin and A, produce Sarah and B. Why boss where you clarify what you were to do the text? Because in our work, the, the translation workshop that we run is the mix of mixes. I mean, you have the full range of people who don't speak anything at all. I mean, but that was the English. Two people who are completely at all in the language in which they are working and everything in between. And so you have to simply say there are different, quote, plus one, you know, there are different readings of different audiences and audience. There's all, we always are writing. Actually, that's a that's a pre-step to the use of a of a of a book like the poem itself. You know, just before you give them uh, a trot and uh, an explanation and say, "Go make your own poem," uh, you do a, a, a series of exercises of, of paraphrase 
where you say, okay, I want you to take this text and make it sound biblical. Or take this biblical text and make it sound like uh, bureaucraties. Um, and they, so they're translating stylistically. Or you can take, I don't know, what's the uh, exercises uh, in style. Raymond uh, Kuno and take any five of the, word, the things that he does in there and say, I want you to take this one and just look at the model. And now I want you to take this passage from this ordinary language piece and make it into that. It's retrograde or it's surprises or whatever it is. Um, the toady he uses all sorts of them. And that, that's a stylistic exercise. It becomes a writing class before it becomes a translation class. And then they, then you give the next stage, which is the poem itself, but the paraphrase is really you want to Well, I just yeah, kind of wanted to pose a question. I think we're really lucky to be in this room with all these people who, you know, because you don't get to talk to people about this very often. And I'm curious what other people are doing or what their experience is. I think that even if a privileged situation is not necessarily is not necessary for this kind of thing. We have people, you know, you might be teaching at a community college or, or whatever, or a high school, and have people who have really linguistic and cultural knowledge that some people who are translators don't have. So I, I'm curious what people are doing or ideas that, or other text ideas please, too. Please share. Well, I teach at, um, or I did teach, well, I am teaching again. I retired, but now I'm back. <laughs> Uh, at Denver School of the Arts, which is a, a uh, bio-audition um, high school with a variety of arts majors, dance, and music, and all the usual things, but it also has a creative writing major, and that's what I taught in. Um, and uh, what working with the high school creative writing majors, uh, it also has a middle school, so so the majors go they go through. Um, seven years of a creative writing program and for a music program or whatever it is. And we often, the feedback we often get from those kids when they go off to college is, these people don't know anything about writing <laughs> because they have to take their freshman courses and they're way past that already. They're, so I, I tried to do a little translation workshop with them in the last couple of years without really knowing what I was doing. And you guys have given me some great ideas already. Um, but I just took, because uh, what they teach at BSA is French and Spanish, um, and so I took a couple of little Emilio Pacheco, like Emilio Pacheco poems, a couple of little small ones. They're small, but they're difficult, those little poems. And then, um, and some French, I forget who I used. Um, and French, I, I don't know. Um, but it didn't matter, because there were students who did, and I divided them into groups, and they worked, they worked on their translations. Um, and, um, and we had this whole discussion about, okay, if you're gonna go to Google Translate, here are the cautions, and here's what you've gotta do, and here's the best way to do that, and that, 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 you know, um, because that's what they're gonna do immediately. And, um, and I gave them some time to do that, and then when we came back and met, and, and people read their lines, and we got the variety of vocabulary that they came up with for, for a particular noun, say, something easy. Um, still, it was pretty neat to watch the light dart, you know, going, oh, what? this is what translation, it, it, it is. And, and um, um, my favorite moment was a, was a senior creative writer who said to me, Mr. Bravo, I am going to translate something every day from now on. <laughs> so, and there are a couple of people who have told me they're still working on trying to do translation, but it, it's not something people who are not in this realm ever think about, that, that and especially at that age, high schoolers, that, that oh, there are choices involved here. There's interpretation, as somebody just said. There's interpretation involved here. Um, so, so that was fun, but that's all I've ever done is just that little <laughs> but not first period if they're seniors because they'll be asleep. <laughs>
to express the caution about doing just a little bit of translation in a class, where uh, I'm remembering a story told by a teacher of mine where he, he did that one day. He was a translator, so he was committed to it, but he did a little bit of translation in this class, and after the class, he talked about differences among like a variety of translations, and after the class, a student came up and said, thank you, professor, for showing me the differences in these translations. It really opened my eyes to translation. I don't think I'm ever going to read another translation in the world again because yeah. I see that it's yeah, all there. So he felt like, oh, right. I failed. I failed. You know? <laughs> so just doing a little bit yeah. can be dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, yeah, that's also why I, I would really encourage you to consider taking this global literacy angle and creating a modest, you know, four course sequence or five course sequence and just. Let it come, you know. Let 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 you know that. Then you have more space to do uh, all of that. Yes. Your hands in the back. Yeah. Note cards are uh, passing around asking you to put your email addresses because one of the projects that we're working on is to 
have a website, a resource website, teaching translation. And I'd like to uh, connect with you. Natasha, you had your hand up? You want to say something? Uh, yeah. It's you. Um, <laughs> so, so workshop format is class format, but I think it probably could be adjusted to, in fact, I'm going to be arguing the very last session of this conference. Say by the by the end of the year, the the next phase of the website is supposed to be launched, and that will include discussion forums. Okay, yes. good. All right. And so if you're in, interested in just teaching translation, then you'll want to be in that forum. Like sure. that. Yeah. What so I am, this, yeah. the, your emails right. can go in there. Yeah. Okay. What I am asking your emails for is that I'm going to send you an email when I get back, asking for you to send me electronically your ideas or your syllabi or whatnot, and I will create a reserve. Now, once the Alta website creates these, we will migrate them there. Okay. Uh, but for for the time being, because you know, this is the third such session I've attended. Every year we have a session like this, and it, and it has probably the most animated conversations, uh, and we need to really keep us in touch after the, the, the session. One of the other practical questions I have, um, so I'll be teaching undergrads, liberal arts. This will be their one touch translation. And the you know, the reality is at the end they get a grade. Right. So my question is how you evaluate this kind of work. <coughs> Russell's which, uh, yeah. which kind? The yeah. analysis that goes with. Right. So if if you're asking them to create a rationale. For their, I mean, you have to spell it out. Right. What goes in the rationale? What do you want to know? I want to know why you pick these words. I want to know who your audience is, for instance. And the audience is a big part. And then you give some, give them some variety of possible audiences. And also, uh, you you want to you want to know why they've chosen the form that they've chosen. So in some cases, they'll say, well, they look at that first paragraph of Notes from Underground and they say, this is a lot like a dialogue. Isn't it a dialogue? But he's talking with himself. So they make it into a dialogue, a play. And that's a really good way to do it. And it's kind of exciting, but they have to explain what in the original text made them think that it looked like a dialogue. And they have to piece out, pull out the pieces. Oh, sure. So if they're able to do that, you grade, what you're grading on is a kind of coherence of their rationale with what it is that they've done. Well, so you can ask them to evaluate their attempt. I mean, what, what are the parts that gave you the most difficulty and what are the parts you think you, you've done? I am doing an independent study with an amazing polyglot freshman. Uh, <laughs> I gave him uh, one of the most translated real case, the, the archaic torso of uh, Apollo. He got so excited, he, gave, he came with two versions of it and I of course had about 18 others. Um, <laughs> But the beauty of it is, when we started talking, he said, you know, I spent an hour on this. He said, <laughs> now. <laughs> but, 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 but what is so wonderful, though, is he now has spent several, several weeks on this one poem, and, and willingly, understanding. So really, I, we have to remi remind ourselves that um, 
like those emotional stages, denial, anger, whatever, <laughs> translators also go through those, right? I mean, and, you know, there is a moment of surrender. Uh, uh, yeah, the acceptance uh, yeah. is not right away evident to even the translator. And I think th th these stages have to be recognized by your student, by our students, that, that in fact, it takes enormous amount of time and effort and creativity and intellectual labor as well um, to, to come up with a translation. And I, this may not work at all universities, but um, so in my grading, I do put a lot of emphasis on the comments or the justification comments in the margin. But the majority of the grading, since, they, since this is a collaborative workshop where they're in pairs, then teams, then units, they do, they, I give them a template, but they do peer evaluation. And at first I didn't think that would work, but undergraduates can be brutal with each other. <laughs> uh, I mean, the first week it's all hunky-dory and they feel, you know, a little bit of, but once they have confidence, they can be much more brutal with their comments with their peers than I really like would be. And so I rely a lot on peer evaluation. And, at the, and not only do I give them a template, but I remove names and details, but I give them peer evaluations from former years to show them what I'm really, you know, it, we need to keep it civil, but it's gotta be constructive and so forth. But uh, they really, I think that's an added bonus to the course when they begin to learn how to evaluate somebody else's work, and then that goes to the grade is as this well. Is that we'd be willing to share? In yeah, I can, I, I can give the template. Well, yeah. the other thing is, you, there are also preliminary stages you, you can ask them to do. One is they have to give you a trot and then there is something called mapping, right? Map this text. Right. What are all the non-negotiables that you really need to, you know, Venuti talks about the ratio of gain and loss. And so what are the things that you will fight the hardest not to lose, right? So, I mean, they have to really map that piece. To, to also give us some uh, encouragement, uh, this summer, um, Three groups of high school uh, students arrived in uh, Iowa City. A group from Armenia, a group from Turkey, and a group from the US. And uh, we put them through a very interesting exercise. And we ask each person to bring a poem or a passage, a literary passage, that they would like to give the other as a gift from their own language. And then we ask them to help the other, help the other, translate that poem to the other's language. So they work very closely with each other. Uh, and this can be done very well with heritage speakers in your classes. Um, and uh, again, it's highly unlikely that the exercise will, will yield award-winning translators, but most of the translation I do, even in order to get to the final published translation, is not award-winning. So I mean, we're sort of giving them the, the experience with all the stages. Anything else? Yeah. Yes. to Rilke when he says, you know, when you come back from another country, you bring a word or a phrase, you know, because that's, that's what is lasting. So. Yes? What is your favorite film on um, translation um, theory or, or translation practice? That, well, <laughs> the, the, I mean, it depends, I mean, it depends on what you're looking for. There are two major source books out there. One is Venuti's translation studies reader. Um, the other is Danny Weisbord's reader uh, on translation. And the Venuti one is, is much more like a critical theory collection. And I would strongly discourage you from using it with unsuspecting students, <laughs> because it, it, is, it is quite substantial. But there are pieces there, Jakobsen is there, uh, you know, Steiner is there, so I mean there are, there, you know, 
there are some landmark statements about translation that you will find there. The advantage of Weisbord is that he always combines theory with examples. So you will talk about Bible translation, you will have Martin Luther and uh, you know the, all, all the uh, prefaces to King James and all of that, but then he will also give you versions that you can incorporate. So it's very handy. I have a couple more. So um, I like this, uh, I've used this book called The Craft of Literary Translation, which is a University of Chicago reader that, that Reiner Schulte and John yeah, Bingham put together. together. So it's a bunch of sh short pieces. Uh, the Craft of Literary Translation. It's uh, Reiner Schulte and John Bigonet. They, they're the editors. And it's, it's a collection, a bunch of different things. And then the other one I, I've used in class is by uh, uh, Lefebvre. It's Translation in a Comparative, liter comparative Literature Context. And the reason I like that one is that it has a lot of very short sections. It's all written by the same person, Andre Lefebvre. And it's but it, the, each one is very really short, and so uh, I find them kind of uh, portable in a way. You can you can take a little section and say, okay, well let's look at let's look at what people have done with homophonic translation, and it's a very short little section that, that deals with Zukovsky's experiments in homophonic translation. It talks about why the Catullus and why, and so it's 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 very thin. It's only about 120 pages, so it's. I find it, it's not too uh, intimidating. There's also an article in Translation Review that um, uh, Washburn did, Kelly Washburn, about uh -huh. translation workshops. It has a good, the, uh, that, the Bukowski uh, site, is in, it has a great bibliography of some of these possibilities. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.